Hey everybody, welcome back to another tier list. We have a very fun episode for today. We are going to be going through the entire discography of the amazing English rock band XTC. I've been super excited about making this video because XTC has such a fun and adventurous discography to go through, and I really love the diversity of thought within the XTC community as well. When you look at how different people rank the XTC discography, they're usually always completely different from one person to the next, and people hold so many different albums of theirs in high regard. And I feel like I've heard convincing arguments for almost all of their albums and as to why they could be regarded as one of their best works. And that's one of the things that I've always loved about them so much. Just a timeless band with some of the most unique and engaging music of the past 40 years. So what I'm going to do is go through all 14 of their studio albums, the 12 XTC albums, and the two Dukes of Stratosphere albums. And I'm going to score each of them on this tier list with S being the highest and D being the lowest, and I'll talk you through a bit of each album, let you know my thoughts, and we will see where we end up. And please feel free to let me know your thoughts in the comments as well. I would love to hear your takes on each of these albums, where you agree with me, where you disagree, which albums you think I might be missing something from, and I would love to hear just where you rank their albums. So please let me know in the comments. I'm very curious. Um, I think that's about it. Let's jump right into it. Okay, we will start out with their debut studio album from 1978 titled White Music. I'm going to give this one a B. Not a bad album, but I wouldn't say that this is one of their stronger works, especially compared to a lot of the stuff that would follow it. But I still think this album does have a lot of good things to offer. Stylistically, this one is much different from a lot of the later works and sort of has this interesting meld of some of the post-punk elements that were developing in England at that time. But it also contains elements of the American bands that Andy had been inspired by as well, such as the New York Dolls, the Ramones, and television. And because they're in their early stages as a band and are trying to find their sound, Andy's singing is much different on here than how it would be in later albums. You know, his voice definitely evolves a lot throughout their discography, and it's a really fascinating process to hear play out. And also the initial lineup of this group did not have Dave Gregory on second guitar and instead had Barry Andrews on piano and organ, which would obviously change the sound and the dynamic of the group. And he would only last for the first two albums and wouldn't become a permanent member of what is regarded as that classic XTC lineup with Andy, Colin, Dave, and Terry. So obviously that changes an element of their sound on their first two releases as well. And I do still think that they do some interesting stuff with this initial lineup that they formed, but there are definitely a couple of dips throughout this album. On side one, for me, the high points are the three Andy Partridge tracks with Radios in Motion, This Is Pop, and Statue of Liberty. Radios in Motion is a great way to bring the listener in for the first track. It has a really high energy, it's very colorful, and it gives us our first taste of that very unique songwriting style of Andy Partridge. This Is Pop is an amazing track regarded as a classic in the XTC community and a really great song to introduce you to Andy's really unique sense of harmony with really colorful chord changes in the guitars. And it also shows his amazing ability of combining different feels and styles within one song in a very cohesive manner. And then Statue of Liberty is just another one that's very feel good, catchy, and another Andy Partridge classic. I will say that I'm not the biggest fan of the Colin Molding songs on side one. I love Colin and he has written some of my favorite XTC songs, but I wouldn't say that this album has some of his strongest contributions, especially in comparison to the Andy Partridge tracks that we've heard so far on side one. I've always felt like Andy's songs sort of carry this album for me. Um, and then the way side one closes is with a cover of All Along the Watchtower and it's cool to hear them play that song but I wouldn't say that it really does much for me it's not something that I feel like I need to hear from XTC so it's a track that I'm sort of indifferent on now for side two I enjoy most of the songs on here but at the same time I wouldn't say that any of them are really standout tracks compared to some of the stuff that we heard on side one I will say that I think I'll Set Myself on Fire is Colin's best song on the album. I definitely enjoy that one the most of the three tracks that he contributes. And I'm Bugged is definitely my favorite Andy track on side two. It's just a very cool song showing some of the more darker and eerie sides of Andy's songwriting, which has always been one of my favorite sides of Andy Partridge. And we will hear that more and more on future albums. 
And another song that I really enjoy on side two is Newtown Animal in a Furnished Cage. It has some really cool chord movements and drum grooves and is just super catchy and a very feel-good vibe. So those are the three high points of side two for me. And the rest of it I would say is good, but not amazing, and it doesn't have a lot of songs that I typically go back and listen to a lot. So for a debut album, I wouldn't say that it's bad by any means. It definitely establishes a sound for them to continue to build off of, and it does contain some of those elements that we know and love from the XTC sound, and it delivers a handful of really amazing tracks. But at the same time, I think it does have some dips throughout, and it has some songs that aren't the strongest, in my opinion. So I would say it's not one of their best albums, but not a bad starting point either. So this one gets a B. Okay, now we have their second studio album from 1978 titled Go To. And unfortunately, I'm going to give this one a C. I've never been a huge fan of this album, and I do think it is a little bit of a downgrade from white music. This would be the last album to feature Barry Andrews due to the fact that there was some tension between him and Andy because Barry was trying to take a much more active role in the composition process, and he would show up to the sessions with his own original songs, and Andy didn't feel like it was going in the direction that he had envisioned for XTC. So because of that, we do have two Barry Andrews originals on this album, as well as six Andy songs and four Colin songs. And the utilization of the keyboard on this album is much different from white music. This album takes on more experimental routes and they achieve some really aggressive and chaotic sounds with the way that they utilize the keys on a lot of these tracks, which I think is actually pretty interesting. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it translates over to a great and consistent album. Uh, one thing that I will say about this album, though, is that it has one of my favorite opening tracks of any XTC album, Mechanic Dancing, Oh We Go. It's such a great song, very dancey and hard-hitting, but also very experimental with some of my favorite guitar and keyboard parts of the entire Barry Andrews period. I really love that chaotic sound that they achieve with how they utilize the keys in this song and the way it goes against the guitar. Such a great opening track and a song that I cannot say enough good things about. But after that track, I do think that we already hit the high point of the album. There's really only one other song on this album that sticks out to me, and I'm sure a lot of people can guess which one I'm talking about. But the remainder of side one has a couple of tracks that I don't mind, but it never matches that momentum and intensity that I felt with Mechanic Dancing. And now with this album, I do think that Colin's songs are a little bit stronger on side one in comparison to the two Andy songs. Uh, Buzz City Talking and The Rhythm are the two other high points of side one for me. And then side two opens up with B-Town, which is the other you know favorite track for me on this album. And a lot of people regard that as an XTC favorite and just another awesome Andy Partridge classic. I really love the intensity that builds throughout this song and the very interesting chord changes. Once again, Andy's very adventurous sense of harmony. And other than B-Town, I wouldn't say that I really care for any of the other Andy songs on side two. Uh, so I do think that white music was a little bit stronger and more consistent in terms of Andy Partridge compositions. And as far as the Barry Andrews stuff goes, I think his two songs on side two are interesting and they have some cool sections, but I could see why Andy wouldn't want the band to go in that direction because to me, it doesn't sound like the XTC that we know. His vocals definitely change the nature and the dynamic of the music, and his songwriting sensibilities are clearly different from Andy and Collins. Uh, whereas I feel like with Andy and Colin, they are different, but they're more complementary and they work really well with each other's differences. But I feel like with Barry, it's kind of distinct and unique to itself, and it almost clashes a bit with the sensibilities of Andy and Colin. And Barry also seemed like he had a bit of a stronger personality and he wasn't afraid to stand up to Andy as well. So obviously that could have caused a lot of friction if he had tried to stay in the band. But after the two Barry Andrews tracks, the album concludes with a Colin track titled I Am The Audience which is definitely my least favorite Colin track on this album. I don't think it's a strong closer. Um, and yeah, like I said, I think pretty much for this album, for me, the opening track and B-Town are the two high points. It has a few songs here and there that I don't mind, but I don't think there are any really exceptional tracks uh, other than the two that I had mentioned. And the Barry Andrews stuff isn't bad, but like I said, it does have a big contrast from that XTC sound, and they aren't really tracks that I typically go back and listen to very often. 
So unfortunately, a bit of a downgrade from White Music and not one of my favorite XTC albums, so this one gets a C. Okay, next we have their third studio album from 1979 titled Drums and Wires. And this one for me is an easy S. I absolutely love this album. This is their first release with Dave Gregory on guitar. And this is the formation of what would be regarded as that classic XTC lineup with Andy, Colin, Dave, and Terry. And I think this is the most perfect album they could have made to set up the foundation for that new sound that they would continue to build off of. I love the continued experimentation with the unique harmonies and chord progressions, and I especially love how we're getting to hear those elements in a two guitar setting as well. And Andy and Dave have so much amazing and complex guitar arrangements throughout this album. And for me, that is definitely one of the main elements that I love so much about XTC as a guitar player. The writing in the guitars is some of the most interesting two guitar parts that you'll ever find with any band. And compositionally, Andy and Colin both contribute amazing tracks throughout this album, combining some of those poppy elements that we had heard in the first two albums, but also exploring a lot of different avenues from song to song, and I feel like this is the first album where we get to hear that experimental side of XTC much more throughout the album, whereas in the previous releases it might just be, you know, here and there scattered a couple of songs. For side one, we have three songs by Colin and three songs by Andy, all amazing tracks, and we open up with a Colin song that is often considered XTC's most popular song, Making Plans for Nigel, a track that obviously goes without saying is incredible, and it's hard to argue that it's not one of the best songs that Colin has ever written for XTC. So I think on this album, this is really where we see the creative explosion come out of Colin, and I feel like compositionally he really came into his own at the start of this album. In addition to that, the other two Colin songs we have are Day In, Day Out and 10 Feet Tall. I love the groove on Day In, Day Out. That syncopated two guitar riff is so cool. And 10 Feet Tall is a really beautiful song. And one thing that I've always liked about Colin's writing, and I'm curious if anybody else has felt the same way, is I feel like a lot of his songs have this really sort of like tender quality to them. And I think it contrasts Andy's writing really nicely. And for me, this is probably the earliest example of one of those songs, one of those more tender Colin Molding tracks with 10 Feet Tall. Um, and we get to hear a lot more of that style on future albums as well. But that was always a standout track for me when it comes to that uh, compositional side of Colin. And then the three Andy Partridge tracks on side one are Helicopter, which is probably the song on this album that is most similar to something that could have been on the first two releases. It's got a very similar energy, uh, but still a great song. And uh, for the people who love the sound of the first two XTC albums, I think it's good to throw in a track like this uh, for those fans. And I also feel similarly about When You're Near Me, I Have Difficulty. Another song that's a little bit more straight ahead and poppy, but once again, an amazing track, a really feel good song. And then side one ends with probably my favorite Andy Partridge track up to this point in the XTC discography with a track called Roads Girdle the Globe. This one very well might even be in my top five XTC songs as well. I mean, this song just gets better and better the more I listen to it. Some of my favorite guitar writing of any XTC song, the two guitar parts in this one are so cool and there's so much dissonance between them. And I just love the way they utilize those dissonant intervals and chord voicings within this song. Then after that, we go to side two, which has five Andy tracks and one Colin track. And we open up with an Andy track titled Real by Real. Once again, a little more similar to the XTC sound from the first two albums, but I love this song as well. I think all of the songs that resemble the first two XTC albums uh, on this one, I feel like they took that sound but they you know, made even better tracks off of that sound. Like I said, I don't think there's a bad track on this album. Uh, and then after that, we have Millions, which is another one of those songs that really shows the adventurous harmonic side of Andy Partridge. I love the guitar parts in this song. There's so much interesting harmony going on and a song that definitely gives me similar vibes to uh, Rhodes Girdle the Globe. Once again, that experimental side of Andy Partridge that we're hearing come out more and more on this album, which is such a great thing. 
And then we have Colin's final track of the album, That Is The Way. Another very cool song showing Colin starting to experiment more with different feels and interesting chord progressions in the guitars. I really love the bass groove on this one too. It just makes everything pop really nicely. Nice use of the flugelhorn too, which was a nice surprise. And then we have three more Andy tracks to conclude the album, starting with the energetic and driving outside world. I don't mind this song, but if I had to pick a least favorite track on here, it would be this one, but I don't think it's a bad song. It just doesn't stand out as much as everything else on here for me, especially in comparison to the last two tracks, Scissor Man and Complicated Game. Both amazing tracks, but I think Complicated Game is really exceptional, and it's the first time that we're really seeing that intensity and darkness that Andy Partridge is capable of creating. Uh, everything about this song is so haunting. The really eerie chord progression, the hard-hitting bass parts, Andy's vocals, the guitar solo, which according to Andy was actually recorded without listening to the backing track. So he was literally just soloing on his own, just in his own tempo. And then they put it on top of the track without actually being aware of the timing or anything involving the backing track, which is really incredible the way that it turned out. And it's a song that just builds to such intensity. And I think this could not be a better song for XTC to close out this album with because they gave us a really nice batch of songs with this new refined sound, with the new lineup, layering of the two guitar parts. And I think ending with a song like this, which is much more intense than everything else on the album, it creates this really cool sense of wonder as to where XTC is going to pick up from on the next album. So I just absolutely love this as a closer. I love this album. I can't say enough good things about it. And this is actually my third favorite XTC album. So as we go through this, you'll get an idea of what my top albums and top songs are. Um, as we narrow things down more and more. But this is my third favorite XTC album. Um, so yeah, like I said, this album just gets better and better the more I listen to it. It's got great replay value. It's got so many timeless tracks and has some of my favorite XTC songs of all time. So this is one that gets an easy S. Okay, next we have their fourth studio album from 1980 titled Black Sea. And this is another one that is an easy S for me. Absolutely amazing album. They continue to build off of the sound that they had established on Drums and Wires. And this is also the first album to showcase Dave Gregory's amazing ability to also double on piano and synth, which is great to hear. And this album, I would say, is a tad brighter than Drums and Wires. More songs that I would say are on the groovy and feel-good side, but it still has no shortage of adventurous material with all sorts of different experimentations and moods going on. It opens up with, in my opinion, the two best songs that Andy and Colin had written for this album with Respectable Street and Generals and Majors. I think these two tracks are the strongest two openers of any of the albums up to this point. I love the way the piano and vocal parts bring in Respectable Street and then we go into this really wacky chord progression on the guitar and establish this really fascinating vibe that just brings in the album on such an awesome note. And then Generals and Majors is the perfect groovy and feel-good track to really bring the energy up and provide a lot of momentum for the album to continue off of. And it was also released as the first single for this album, and I think that was the perfect choice as a single. And then after that, we go through Andy's politically charged track, Living Through Another Cuba. I love the vibe of this song. Really unique guitar part, and I love how it interacts with the bass and really tasteful drum grooves as well. And in general, throughout this album, I love everything that Terry Chambers is coming up with. Very groovy and also doing a great job of incorporating some of those disco elements, but in a very tasteful way. And with the mix and the production, the drums just sound very huge throughout this album. After that, we have the only other Colin Molding track from this album, Love at First Sight. A very tasteful and groovy love song song and another great contribution to side one. I really love the guitar layering on this one as well. Very cool stuff. Uh, and then side one concludes with two more Andy Partridge tracks, Rocket from a Bottle and No Language in Our Lungs. I love the vibe of Rocket from a Bottle. Very cool vocal work. I love the eighth note bass line. The guitar solo is very interesting. A lot of cool wide intervals happening. And then No Language in Our Lungs, a really nice mid-tempo track that has a lot of interesting elements to it. And it goes into some really interesting spots between the band, but still gives us that more relaxed conclusion to side one. And then for side two, we have 
five more Andy Partridge originals, starting with Towers of London, an absolutely beautiful song, which was also released as the second single to this album. And then after that, we have a song called Paper and Iron, which is a great song to demonstrate Andy Partridge's wacky guitar parts, as well as his amazing ability to write really interesting sections rhythmically as well as groove-wise. And then we have Burning with Optimism's Flame, which is one of my all-time favorite XTC songs when it comes to the cool rhythmic grooves and the sort of polyrhythms that are going on between the guitar parts and the drums. Andy has this great way of writing riffs and rhythms where beat one is not always entirely clear, but the way that the groove is constructed, it kind of just floats over one another and this song is a great example of that and we'll hear a lot more of that in future albums and i've heard andy talk about his riff construction before and i don't think that he is really consciously trying to write something in a different meter or any sort of polyrhythm i think he typically just does things more off of feel and sound which makes it even more impressive to me that he's able to write songs like this just you know by using his intuition using his ear just really amazing stuff after that, we have Sergeant Rock is Going to Help Me, which I would say is not a bad song, but probably my least favorite on this album, if I had to pick one. And Andy actually really dislikes this song as well. He had originally not wanted to put this song on the album, but Virgin had insisted. But nonetheless, I don't think it's a terrible track. Then the album concludes in a very similar tone to how Drums and Wires concluded with a very dark and intense track titled Travels in Nihilon. This song is just seven minutes of intensity that continues to build and get noisier and more chaotic as it goes on, and eventually it dies down to the sound of just rain for about 45 seconds. Such a hard-hitting and powerful way to conclude this album, reaching similar intensity levels to Complicated Game, and once again, just leaving the listener on this awesome cliffhanger where you're wondering where they're going to continue off of from where they're leaving off. Just a very great track to conclude this album. Definitely the most experimental and dark song from this album. And like I said, I do think overall this album is a little bit brighter and more upbeat than Drums and Wires, but it ends with that darkness, which I really like. And yeah, just an overall amazing album. I would say that I do like Drums and Wires slightly more, but this one is certainly a close second for me and a great continuation on what they had started on their previous album. So another great album, another one that's an easy S. All right, next we have their fifth studio album from 1982, which is a double album titled English Settlement. And I will give this one an S as well. Incredible album. On this one, we definitely hear a shift compositionally and instrumentally from the previous two albums, where this one has longer, more stretched out songs and features acoustic guitars, 12-string electric guitars, and fretless bass, as well as a little bit of electronic drums. And at this point, Andy had been extremely burnt out by their touring schedule and deliberately wanted to write songs that weren't as practical for live performances in hopes of eliminating the pressure to tour. And about a month after this album was released, Andy suffered a nervous breakdown at a live show, which would result in XTC completely stopping live performances and switching to just being a studio band. Now, in terms of what I think about this record, I know a lot of people regard this as their number one XTC album. And while I do love this album a lot, I wouldn't say that it's my number one favorite of theirs. And for whatever reason for me, of all of the albums that I'm going to put on the S tier, this is probably the one that I listen to the least. Just because that I find with this album, I do have to be in a very specific mood to listen to it. Whereas with an album like Drums and Wires or Black Sea, I could pretty much put them on at any time. And I think a lot of it has to do with, like I said, the longer, more stretched out songs. And also the fact that it's a double album. So it's a much longer listen, more of a commitment. But when I am in the mood for it, this album is a very pleasant and adventurous experience. And I'm curious if anybody else has similar feelings about this album. I kind of feel like uh, I'm in the minority with that opinion because I know so many people say this is their best XTC album. But that's just always been my feeling, uh, at least in terms of you know, going back and listening to it and the replay value. I love the way it opens up on side one with two Colin Molding tracks right off the bat with Runaways and Ball and Chain. Runaways is such a nice track to bring the album in. It builds everything up very nicely. And then Ball and Chain gives us some nice poppy and energetic vibes, providing a nice contrast 
to the opening track. And then side one will finish up with two incredible Andy Partridge tracks, Senses Working Overtime and Jason and the Argonauts. Most people regard Senses Working Overtime as one of Andy Partridge's best tracks, and I would not argue with that. It's an amazing song. And I think it's another song that's a great example of Andy's amazing ability to take sections with much different feels and moods and combine them in a very cohesive manner. And Jason in the Argonauts is so beautiful and euphoric. I absolutely love the guitar work on this one. And this song goes in some really interesting territories with all sorts of surprising harmonies and grooves continuously popping up over the course of the six minutes. I would say that side one is my favorite of the four sides on this album, but all of the sides are great. For side two, we have three more Andy Partridge originals with No Thugs in Our House, Yacht Dance, and All of a Sudden It's Too Late. No Thugs in Our House opens things up really nicely with a more poppy feel and some tasty, bluesy guitar riffs. And then Yacht Dance is probably my favorite acoustic center track on this album. It's got such a great groove to it, and it really does elicit imagery of being on the water. I love the placement of this track as well. I think it provides a really nice contrast in feel from everything else that we've heard up to this point. And then All of a Sudden It's Too Late closes side two on a nice chill note. Really great writing between the electric and acoustic guitars and some very tasteful Andy Partridge vocal melodies and chord progressions. Side 3 consists of all Andy Partridge songs again with four tracks, Melt the Guns, Leisure, It's Nearly Africa, and Knuckle Down. I love Melt the Guns as an opener, another track that goes in many different directions, incorporating so many different feels and moods. I don't mind Leisure, but that's probably my least favorite song up to this point on the album. Wouldn't say it's a bad song, I just don't think it stands out very much in comparison to everything else that we've heard thus far. But I absolutely love the two tracks that conclude Side 3 with It's Nearly Africa and Knuckle Down. I love the vibe of It's Nearly Africa, really cool drum grooves. I love the use of the synth against the acoustic guitars. The vocal melodies are very catchy, and once again, just a very cool song that provides a nice contrasting sound to a lot of the other stuff that we had heard up to this point, similar to how I felt about Yacht Dance on side two. And I think we get a lot more of that throughout this album because it's a double album, and also because of the fact that they were kind of deliberately trying to write more studio-based songs. So because of that, we're getting a much wider variety of you know styles and different moods throughout the album. Uh, and then Knuckle Down just grooves so hard, one of my favorite drum beats on the album. And once again, great writing between the electric and acoustic guitars, a very groovy way to conclude Side 3. And then Side 4 opens up with a Colin Moulding song. We have not heard from him since Side 1, and this song is called Fly on the Wall. And believe it or not, this might actually be my favorite song on the album. Uh, I know that's kind of a random choice, but I just love everything about this song. The synth sounds, Colin's beautiful and catchy vocal melodies, the alternating between the distorted and clean vocals, as well as the really tasteful chord progressions in the guitar. To me, this has always been one of the standout tracks from this album, and in my opinion, Colin's strongest contribution on this album. Then we have an Andy track titled Down in the Cockpit, which would probably be my least favorite song on here. Another song that, you know, just doesn't do much for me. I wouldn't say it's a terrible song, but I don't think it stands out in comparison to everything else. And then we have another Colin track called English Roundabout, a very cool feel-good song with really interesting rhythmic hits going on between the drums and the guitars. And Colin's vocal melody just floats over these grooves in such an effortless fashion. Colin's songwriting really evolves and goes into some amazing territories throughout this album. I think all four of his contributions on here are very strong tracks and are all very different from one another. And it's just very nice to hear Colin's uh, compositions continue to evolve more and more. Then the album concludes with an Andy Partridge track called Snowman. And this is a song that doesn't go in the same dark and intense directions as the closing songs from Drums and Wires and Black Sea, but it's a very pretty track with some really nice layered guitar parts and a very tasteful bass line. A very fitting conclusion to this new sound that they had established on this album. And like I said, I do need to be in a particular mood to listen to this album all the way through, but it does have a lot of great individual tracks that I enjoy listening to on their own, and a very adventurous track listing with lots of twists and turns, and a lot of songs that are you know regarded as some of the most classic XTC songs ever. And for a double album, I think it's got a great momentum, and each side offers us tracks with something new and something surprising. So, great album, this one gets an S.
Okay, next we have their sixth studio album from 1983 titled Mummer. I'm going to give this one a B. I've always been kind of torn about how I feel about this album because it does have a solid batch of tracks that I absolutely love, but at the same time, it does have some skip over tracks that I do think take away from the momentum of the album to some extent. This ended up being one of their lowest selling albums, and it took a big dip from the momentum that they had established on English Settlement. And as a band, they were also in a very weird spot. Their relationship with Virgin was not good at this point, and the decision to stop touring was not something that Terry Chambers had wanted which was understandable. He had a pregnant wife at the time, and obviously touring can provide some revenue for someone in his position. So this would unfortunately end up being the last XTC album that Terry Chambers would play on, and he was only featured on two songs, or three if you include the bonus tracks. And because of that, they would start utilizing some electronic drums as well. So I think the combination of all of these different things that were happening probably created a weird environment that wasn't the best for getting out their full potential and creativity in the songwriting process. One thing I will say about this album, though, is I think that Side One is very strong, and all of my favorite tracks on here are on Side One. It opens up with a beautiful Andy Partridge track called Beating of Hearts, an amazing way to bring everything in, a song that starts Starts out more subtle but continues to add layers upon layers of parts. Beautiful vocal melodies and vocal work on Andy's part. And then we go into an incredible Colin Moulding song called Wonderland, a synth-based song mostly centered around the Prophet 5, which was the band's main synthesizer at that time. And I just think this song has such a peaceful and serene mood to it with the synthesizer. And I think it's just a completely different sound that we hadn't heard from XTC at this point, but I think they utilized it in a very tasteful way. Then we go into my favorite track on this album, an Andy Partridge song called Love on a Farm Boy's Wages. And I would say that a lot of people regard this one as one of Andy's best compositions. And I would definitely agree with that. This would most likely make my top 10 favorite Andy Partridge songs. Such awesome acoustic guitar parts, very technical and really showcasing some of Andy's chops with the alternate picking. And just in general, such a beautiful and adventurous song. And then it's followed up by another very cool Andy track called Great Fire. So up to this point, I think this album has been amazing. The first four tracks are rock solid. Uh, but then from this point on for the remainder of the album, this is where I start to feel some of the dips in the momentum. The closing track to side one, a Colin Moulding track called Deliver Us From The Elements, is a song that I've never found very intriguing or exciting. To me, it just takes the momentum that had been established from the first four tracks, and it sort of closes it off on this underwhelming fashion. And then Side 2 opens up with an Andy track called Alchemy, which is another song that I don't find that exciting. But then it's followed by a very cool song called Lady Bird, which I would definitely say is my favorite track on Side 2. Another great song to showcase Andy Partridge's really unique sense of harmony, just very experimental choices of melody and chord progressions. I like the softness in the electronic drums too. It almost has this jazzy sort of quality to it. Sounds like they're using brushes. And then after that, we have another Colin Moulding song called In Loving Memory of a Name. And this one I actually do enjoy a lot. This one has great synth sounds. Colin's vocal melodies are very pretty and catchy. And in general, I just love the vibe of this song. But unfortunately, from this point on, I think we've reached all of the high points of Side 2. The last two tracks really don't do much for me. There are two more Andy Partridge tracks titled Me in the Wind and Funk Papa Roll. They've always been kind of skip over tracks for this album. And one big difference for me when I am talking about the songs I dislike on this album compared to the previous three albums, all of my least favorite songs on here, I think they are significantly worse songs than any of my least favorite songs from Drums and Wires, Black Sea, or English Settlement. So I think that's another big thing that differentiates this album and makes it get bumped down to the B tier because like I said I thought side one was very strong up to the first four tracks and if it had continued that momentum it definitely would have been in an A or S tier for me and like I said I think all of the reasons as to why this album is so all over the place in quality has everything to do with all of the weird stuff that had been going on in the band at that time and due to the fact that Andy had suffered his breakdown prior to working on this album so 
just in general, I think the band was in a really weird state. But at the same time, like I said, there are still a really nice handful of tracks on here that are absolutely amazing. And I would say that about 60% of this album is incredible. But that 40%, unfortunately, for me, really does weigh down the quality of this album a bit. So not a bad album, but not one of their best. This one gets a B. All right, now we have their seventh studio album from 1984 titled The Big Express. This is a very fascinating album to me because a lot of the XTC community is pretty divided on this one. I have noticed a lot of people will list this as one of their worst albums. And then there's another branch of people who defend this album and think that it's a lot better than some people give it credit for. And I definitely fall into the second camp. I actually really enjoy this album. I'm gonna give this one an A. Similar to the previous release, I will say that there are a chunk of songs on here that I do find kind of boring and do take away from the album to some degree. But at the same time, I think the stronger songs on this album are just so awesome. And I do feel like I really love about 80% of this album. In particular, side one, I actually find myself going back and listening to the first side of this album probably more than any other XTC album, believe it or not. I just find all five songs on side one to be so enjoyable. I honestly think that side one of this album is pretty close to perfect um, if you're into kind of stylistically what they're giving you on the first side of this album because it's not like every other XTC album, obviously. But I love the way it opens up. It starts with a great Colin Molding track called Wake Up. I love how it opens up with those alternating guitar parts that are panned to the right and the left and then the drum groove comes in. Very cool opener and a very fresh sound too. I love the use of the synthesizers and in general it just sounds like uh, another song that is showing us a side of XTC that we hadn't heard before. Um, and at this point, they were using Lin drums, so we were getting a lot of that electronic drum sound mixed in with some real drums as well from Pete Phipps. But I do think that because of the electronic drums, it did enable them to try to go into some different areas creatively through the writing process of this album, and I think it resulted in a lot of really awesome songs. Track two is the beautiful Andy Partridge song, All You Pretty Girls. One of the catchiest choruses of any XTC song, in my opinion. I find this song getting stuck in my head all the time. I love the production. Everything sounds so huge. The melodies really shine through exceptionally on this song. And then that's followed by an awesome groovy song titled Shake You Donkey Up. And similar to what we've heard on some previous XTC songs, a very interesting use of polyrhythms and multiple time signatures on top of each other over the bar line sort of stuff. We have that melody overlapping on top of the drum uh, in the chorus. Such a cool effect and I absolutely love whenever XTC does something like that. Then after that we go into the dark and ominous Andy Partridge track Seagull Screaming Kisser Kisser, a song that I absolutely love. The first time I heard this song it immediately brought me in. I was just so gripped by that eerie keyboard sound and that dark melody on top of it. Uh, as I said, I always love hearing the dark side of Andy Partridge. I think he produces some really magical sounding things. And a fun fact about this song, this was actually the first song that Andy had ever written on keyboard. Uh, so a little fun fact. And then after that, side one closes beautifully with the sad, down-tempo Andy Partridge track, This World Over. Such an amazing, sad song. Some really strong melodies from Andy, really cool bass lines, and just a very strong closer to side one. So as you can see, stylistically, side one goes in and out of a lot of different feels, but every single song, I think, on side one is incredibly strong. Um, in their own ways, and I just you know always find myself going back to listening to side one. Um, I do think that when we get to side two, that is definitely where the album does lose some momentum for me. I don't mind the opener, the everyday story of Small Town. It's kind of like a feel-good Andy Partridge track. Um, it's very fun and catchy. It has a great energy to it. Um, I don't like it as much as any of the tracks from side one, but uh, I do think it is one of the better tracks from side two. Uh, and then after that, we actually have another song that I really enjoy too, a beautiful Andy Partridge ballad titled I Bought Myself a Liar Bird. I love this song. It's got just great guitar parts, amazing vocal melodies, and it has a very serene and tender sound. To me, I always kind of considered this song to be like, uh, like what Blackbird is to the Beatles. This is like XTC's uh, version of like a, a song like Blackbird. After that, though, we get to the part of the album where I do think some of the momentum does die down um, with the next two tracks with Rain of Blows and You're the Wish You Are I Had. 
they're both Andy Partridge songs, and I just find both of them kind of underwhelming. They've never done much for me, uh, and do take away from side two. Uh, but then after that, we have a Colin song that I've always really enjoyed, titled I Remember the Sun. Very different sound from the other track he contributed to this album with Wake Up. This one has almost some fusion-like elements to it with the harmony and the production, the instrumentation, just the overall um, you know sound and mix of the band. I think the song has a really badass quality to it and I particularly love the chorus. I love the piano parts underneath Colin's vocals and for me this is actually probably the standout track of side two uh, other than I bought myself a liar bird. After that, Side 2 concludes with a track titled Train Running Low on Soul Cole. This is a weird song. I'm sort of indifferent about this song. There are some times when I listen to it and I'm into it, and then other times I'm just not in the mood for it, and it's sort of a skip over track. So it's always been one of those weird XTC songs for me where I'm just kind of right in the middle of it. So I don't think it's a bad track, but I also wouldn't say it's an amazing and strong closer, especially compared to the last couple of albums and the closing songs that they had. So similar to the previous release, Mummer, all of my issues with this album start happening on side two, but the main difference I would say here is that I think side one on this album is even stronger than Mummer, and side two has a couple of more redeeming qualities than side two on Mummer. And like I said, I go back and listen to side one of this album probably more than almost any other XTC album, and I'm sure that will surprise some people, but I'm curious if anyone else um, is also... Uh, in the same camp as me when it comes to this album. Uh, so yeah, uh, just, you know, a very solid album, but definitely not good enough to justify putting an S tier, but definitely above everything in B tier. So this one gets an A. Okay, next we have their eighth album, or technically you could say it's their first album, depending on how you view it. But this is the first of two releases of their spinoff band, The Dukes of Stratosphere. This is basically a band that Andy and Dave had been talking about doing since the late 70s. And the idea behind it was basically Andy wanting to live out his childhood fantasies of being in a psychedelic rock band. Uh, and also using this as a way of paying tribute to all of the English psychedelic rock bands that had influenced him, specifically from the years 1967 and 68. The lineup still features the core three members of the group from that time with Andy, Colin, and Dave, but it also features Dave's brother, Ian Gregory, on drums. And like I said, this is one of two releases by the spin-off band, The Dukes of Stratosphere, and this would be put out as the first release from 1985 called 25 O'Clock. And I'm going to give this one an A. I really enjoy this album. It's got a great energy to it. I think each track balances each other out very nicely. It's a nice shift in mood from song to song, but it's all very much within that late 60s psychedelic realm, really embracing those influences from some of those psychedelic groups like the Beatles, Pink Floyd, Small Faces, and Tomorrow. And it's a quick listen with only six tracks, five of them by Andy and one by Colin. I love all of Andy's tracks on here, but for me, the highlights are really the opening two tracks, 25 O'Clock and Bike Ride to the Moon, as well as the closing track, The Mole from the Ministry. Colin's track, which opens up side two, is titled What in the World, and that's a really amazing song too. It sounds like something that could have been right off of a Beatles album from 67 or 68. I love the instrumentation and the equipment that they use. They did a great job of really capturing that late 60s sound, which was such a specific vibe throughout the course of music, and they did a really great job of recreating that. And I think all of the utilizations of the pianos, the organ, and the Mellotron are all very tasteful. I will say this is another one of those albums where I do need to be in a specific mood to listen to it. I don't find myself going back to this album as much as I do with any of the XTC albums. But like I said, this is a really awesome handful of songs and it's fun to be able to see Andy and Colin showcase their uh, talents when it comes to psychedelic music and psychedelic writing as well. So a very fun album. This one gets an A. Okay, now we finally get to their ninth studio album from 1986 titled Skylarking. Obviously, this one gets an S. Insane album, and this one is often regarded as their best album. And I know it's cliche to say, but this is my favorite album as well. I do agree with that sentiment. Um, I always feel cliche saying it, but then I go back and listen to it, and it's just so good and so strong. It, it's just so hard uh, to not have this be my favorite album. It's, it's packed with so many incredible songs, and it's an album that I can listen to anytime and never get tired of it. 
Um, there's some really interesting history behind this album for anybody who isn't aware. So Todd Rundgren ended up being the one to produce this album. And all throughout the process of this album getting made, there was constant tension between Todd and Andy. Todd Rundgren can be a stern guy, and he wasn't afraid to put his foot down and make decisions. And that didn't always work well with Andy's work habits. You just had very clashing personalities and you can hear both sides of their stories through various interviews and it can get a little unclear as to what the truth is with everything but the bottom line for me is that personalities aside the combination of Todd Rundgren and Andy Partridge was absolute magic Andy and Collins songwriting throughout this album is top-notch and Todd's production orchestral arrangements and programming provides so much depth and richness to these songs there are so many little subtleties going on throughout every single one of these songs. And the way that this album was put together was that they had a bunch of songs already written and Todd had come up with the idea of taking this batch of songs and assembling them in an order that somewhat resembles a loose concept album based around some sort of cycle or period of time. Uh, so side one opens up beautifully with an amazing Andy song called Summer's Cauldron. Definitely one of my favorite songs on this album. Such a bright and colorful track that brings things in so nicely and connects perfectly into track two, which is a Colin Molding track titled Grass. A beautiful follow up that really keeps the momentum and that cycle feeling going from track to track. And, you know, it transitions so smoothly that if you didn't know any better, you could potentially think that this is just one long extended song, which is exactly what they were going for. Um, and then at the end of track two, we reintroduce the drones and the nature sounds that we heard at the start of the album. And then it connects into another Colin track called The Meeting Place. Another very pretty song. Great drum programming. I love Colin's bass line on this one. It's very jumpy and really tasteful. And then we go into my favorite Andy Partridge track from this album, one of my favorite XTC songs called That's Really Super Super Girl. There is so much intricacy and depth to this song. I love the synth sounds and how they combine with the guitars. Andy's vocal melodies and chord changes are all over the place and are so colorful. And it also has one of my favorite guitar solos of Dave Gregory as well. Incredible guitar work from Dave. Um, just has every single thing I love about XTC. And then that great solo from Dave is just like the cherry on top of like the perfect song. And yeah, I would comfortably say this is one of my favorite XTC songs. Um, could never get enough of this song. And then that's followed up by another beautiful Andy track called Ballet for a Rainy Day. I definitely hear some hints of later Brian Wilson in this one, particularly in the verse. And I've heard Andy cite Brian Wilson as an influence. And I think from this point on throughout the remainder of the XTC discography, I think this is where we kind of start to see more of the Brian Wilson influence on Andy come into fruition. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but that's just something that I've kind of observed. I'm curious if anybody else agrees with that. Um, but I love this song, another beautiful, uh, amazing track. And after that, the vibe changes up to an orchestral track called A Thousand Umbrellas. Amazing string arrangements done by Dave Gregory, definitely giving us some of those 60s psychedelic sounds from the albums like Magical Mystery Tour. And the fact that Dave is able to do string arrangements, guitars, keys, I really think Dave Gregory is like the secret weapon of XTC, and you can really see it throughout this album. Um, I love the placement of this track as well because it, it gives us a nice little detour from everything that we've heard thus far and sets up the final track of Side One so nicely with Season Cycle. A nice upbeat track that also once again gives me some hints of Brian Wilson, which I love. Then Side Two opens up with a hard-hitting poppy track that to me just completely resembles the Revolver era Beatles titled Earn Enough For Us. Such an awesome song and one that always puts me in a good headspace when I put it on. Awesome opener to side two. And then we have probably my favorite Colin track on here titled Big Day. Uh, a song about getting married, but a very unconventional vibe for what you would consider a marriage song, which is why I love it so much. Uh, I got married recently and I listened to this song on the way to the wedding and on the way home. And it, it was like, for someone like me, it was the perfect wedding song. So uh, I think that's why I love this song so much. And I'm sure many other people listening to this have had the same experience. I mean, it's just a great song. Um, and then from this point on, there are a couple of variations for the remainder of the tracks, uh, depending on which version you listen to. But the original vinyl continued with an Andy track 
called Another Satellite. This track was originally not going to be on the album, according to Todd Rundgren. Uh, Andy was reluctant to put Dear God on the album because of fears as to what the reaction would be to it. So they initially took Dear God off of the record and replaced it with this song. And I would say this is definitely my least favorite track on the album. I, I don't think it's a bad song, but I think if Dear God was initially put in place of this track, then the album would have been completely perfect. This is sort of the only little dip. Um, but they did eventually re-release it with Dear God included, which is obviously the most popular song on this record. So it would make sense that they would do that. Um, and after that, we have Mermaid Smiled, an absolutely beautiful track with lush guitar parts and amazing vocal work from Andy. Very adventurous harmonies, and I love the use of the percussion and the xylophone. Just amazing instrumentation. Then we have The Man Who Sailed Around His Soul. This is an interesting song because I remember when I first put this album on, this was the one song that I wasn't sure if I was going to like when I first put it on. But then when the drums came in and it goes into that really tasteful groove, this song definitely grew on me. And then the original release closes with two more uh, beautiful Colin tracks. The first one is Dying, a very dark and eerie song that shows us a side of Colin that I feel like we haven't seen very much up to this point. Definitely channeling some of those dark elements that I think we hear a lot more from with Andy and it's cool to see Colin kind of more in that light and a, a very beautiful track to set up the closer which is titled Sacrificial Bonfire a beautiful and relaxed track mixed with acoustic guitars and percussion and I always think of you know being at a bonfire when I hear this song it completely produces the imagery that it's meaning to and I think it's the perfect conclusion to this whole idea of this song cycle it just you know ends things on a very hopeful and positive sort of note and provides a really just beautiful conclusion to this sequence of songs. Um, however, on the re-release, they also do include Dear God, which I think most people regard as a track from this album. Um, and it goes without saying, this is one of XTC's most classic songs. Very interesting chord progressions. Uh, I'm going to get technical for a second, but this is one of the few rock songs that I've heard that uses a major 7 sharp 5 chord, which is just another example of Andy's brilliant and you know natural sense of harmony where he's not approaching it from a theoretical perspective but just from using his ear he can find all of these very exotic harmonies that are not typically found in this kind of music um but yeah everything about this album is incredible and since i've gone through xtc's discography this one has always consistently stayed up there as my number one um so yeah so my number one is skylarking my number three is drums and wires but we are still waiting on number two we haven't gotten to that one yet but we still have five albums to go so we will find out shortly but yeah it goes without saying incredible album this one gets an easy s all right, next we have the 10th studio album, or if you prefer to think of it, the second Dukes of Stratosphere album from 1987 titled Sonic Sunspot. I think I'm going to give this one a B. I was sort of conflicted on the scoring for this one because I do like it, but I definitely don't like it as much as 25 o'clock. There are some cool tracks on this one, but I think it is a slight downgrade, and I don't tend to go back and listen to this album as much as their first album. It continues very much on that same uh, late 60s psychedelic rock trajectory, and it opens up with a really nice Colin Molding track titled Vanishing Girl, uh, definitely channeling some of that psychedelic Beatles era sound. And one of the stronger tracks on this album, in my opinion, a very good opener. And then the remaining four tracks on side one are all Andy Partridge tracks. And the first two I've never been particularly crazy about, uh, Have You Seen Jackie and Little Lighthouse. I don't find them to be as strong as the Andy Partridge songs that opened up uh, 25 o'clock. But I really like the song after that one, You're a Good Man, Albert Brown. I love the piano work, another one that's very much channels that later Beatles sound, which I always love to hear. And then side one ends with a song called Kaleidoscope. I think this song is pretty cool. It's not one of my favorites on here, but there is some interesting stuff going on for sure. Side two opens up with my favorite song on here, You're My Drug, a very groovy and sensual Andy Partridge track, really tasteful vibes. I love the use of the phaser on this one, really capturing those psych psychedelic elements in a very exceptional manner. And then we have a Colin track titled Shiny Cage, which shares so many resemblances to I'm Only Sleeping by the Beatles. And as I'm reviewing this, I'm realizing how often I am drawing comparisons to the Beatles on this album. So I would definitely say this one has much more of that Beatles psychedelic uh, flavor uh, in comparison to 25 O'Clock. 
Then after that we have another beautiful Andy track titled Brainiac's Daughter. I particularly love Andy's falsetto singing in this one. I definitely get some Jeff Lynn Electric Light Orchestra kinds of vibes in this, which is very nice to hear. And then we have Colin's final track on here titled The Affiliated. A pretty cool song, but not a really standout track on this album for me. Um, and then after that, we wrap it up with another Andy Partridge track titled Pale and Precious. Definitely one of those tracks where I hear some of those Brian Wilson influences coming from Andy. And a nice way to wrap things up. So, you know, as you can see, there are a lot of tracks on here that I really enjoy. But overall, I don't think it is as strong as 25 O'Clock. And I don't think the good songs on this one stick out as much as the songs that I like on 25 O'Clock. So not a bad album, but a bit of a downgrade from the previous release. So I would give this one a B. Okay, now we have their 11th studio album from 1989, a double album titled Oranges and Lemons. And for me, this one gets an easy S. And here's the big reveal. This is my second favorite XTC album. So top three, we have one is Skylarking, two is Oranges and Lemons, and three is Drums and Wires. Um, so for me with this album, I liked it a lot the first time I listened to it, but this album really grew on me the more and more I listened to it. It's just packed with so many great tracks. Stylistically, it's giving us a little bit of everything, which is really nice. There's definitely a chunk of this album that is very poppy, but then there's also some very experimental stuff, some psychedelic stuff. And Colin's three originals are each very distinct and unique in their own ways. And just the combination of all of those elements provides a very fun and adventurous set of tracks. And as far as double albums go, I think this is one of the most consistent double albums of all time, in my opinion. Every single side is great. It has a really good momentum to it. And it's just jam-packed with songs that are very unique and engaging all the way throughout. Side one opens up with Garden of Earthly Delights, a catchy, high energy and feel good Andy Partridge pop track that brings everything in very nicely. And then that is followed by two songs that are both so incredibly strong. Uh, Mayor of Simpleton and King for a Day. Both tracks, I would say, are amongst Andy and Colin's best compositions of the entire XTC discography. And having those two songs back to back right at the this early part of the album is just absolutely incredible. And then we change gears a bit and side one ends with a little bit more of a laid back but eerie sort of track called Here Comes President Kill Again. Definitely a change in mood from what we have established so far on the first three tracks. But I don't mind this song. It provides a nice little chill experimental detail tour to conclude this side and set up side two which opens up with another poppy Andy Partridge track titled The Loving. I absolutely love Andy's vocal melodies on this song. This is another song that I find to be one of the most catchiest XTC vocal melodies. I think Andy's pop sensibilities and his sense of melody are really just at their peak throughout this album. So many beautiful melodies. And then after that, we have another Andy Partridge track titled Poor Skeleton Steps Out, a very groovy song with some sort of xylophone sound going on that adds these very interesting hints of world music to it and then we have Colin's second track one of the millions not a bad song but up to this point this is definitely my least favorite track that we've heard thus far and this is like the one sort of skip over track for me on side two but then we end with an incredible Andy Partridge track called Scarecrow People, which is definitely one of my favorite songs on here. Some of the most interesting chord progressions of any song on this album, really showing you Andy Partridge's very adventurous and wacky sense of harmony, and also a very cool guitar solo as well. And just in general, I think the guitar stuff throughout this album is very solid, and it contains some of my favorite chord progressions and guitar parts of any XTC album, another reason why I love it so much. Side 3 opens up with Merely a Man, a very fun and dancey track, and I really love the groove that happens at the end of the chorus when it goes into the cowbell, and Andy has this awesome triplet vocal melody on top of it. To me, that section just completely ties the entire song together and just makes it pop so nicely. And then we have Colin's third and final song from this album titled Cynical Days, a very dreary song and once again a great example of what I would call that tender side that Colin brings and a big contrast from King for a Day. And I think throughout this album, Colin's songs provide a really nice contrast and balance off of Andy's writings very nicely. And then side three concludes with Across This Ant Heap. 
an incredible song and to me this whole song is basically just a giant anticipation for the final section that final section goes so hard and is in my opinion one of the most intense musical sections of any xtc song the layering that's going on between the guitars the keys and andy's beautiful vocal parts that are layering on top of each other it's just so intense and so much beautiful melody happening on top of one another i would say it's one of my favorite moments of any xtc song the absolute perfect conclusion to side three in my opinion and after that side four wraps up the album with four more andy partridge songs the first two being more on the poppy side and then the final two being more experimental the first track is hold me my daddy and i know a lot of people like this song but for some reason this song has just never done anything for me and no matter how many times i listen to it it just never grows on me and i would say this is like the one song that i don't like on this album but i think everything else is so strong that one track like this is not the end of the world it doesn't take away from the album that much but this is the skip over track on this album for me but I do like the song after it, which is Pink Thing. Still within that poppy realm, but a little bit more experimental with the chord progressions and the feel changes from section to section. So definitely an interesting song. And then that is followed by Miniature Sun, an amazingly eerie track. We have some fusion elements going on here within the harmony and the keyboard sounds that are being used, as well as the trumpet lines. One of the more fusion-y XTC songs, I would say. And then the album concludes with Chalk Hills and Children. I absolutely love this song. It's my favorite song on this album and would probably make my top five favorite XTC song list. Uh, of all of Andy's experimental tracks on here, I think this one is just the coolest. I love the vibe. It's so spacey. The keys are so euphoric. And Andy's vocal work and chord progressions on this one are so tasteful. It could not have ended on a better track, in my opinion. So although there are two tracks that I'm not crazy about, like I said, the remainder of this album is so strong and they're hitting us with so many high quality and classic XTC tracks that this is definitely one of my favorite XTC albums. This album has a great variety and a depth to it and has incredible replay value so this is my second favorite xtc album this one gets an easy s okay next we have their 12th studio album from 1992 titled non such and i had to think about this one a lot but ultimately i decided on giving this one an s i really love this album and to me it definitely feels like a continuation off of oranges and lemons in terms of the songwriting style but we're also getting some more orchestral arrangements on this one so we're hearing the sounds continue to evolve more I don't like this album as much as Oranges and Lemons, but I still think it's awesome. And for a 17-track album, I think it's very consistent and adventurous and delivers us a whole new tasty batch of XTC tracks. And I think they also stretch out a bit more on this one, a few more of the experimental Andy Partridge songs, which I really appreciate about this one. It features 13 Andy tracks and four Colin tracks. And right off of the bat, it opens up with one of the hits from the album, The Ballad of Peter Pumpkinhead. A very beautiful and poppy Andy Partridge track that opens things up in a very nice feel-good vibe. And then from there, we change gears a bit and we go into a Colin track titled My Bird Performs. I love this song, and I would actually say this is my favorite Colin song on this album, and one of the more underrated Colin molding tracks, in my opinion. I love everything about this song, the guitar parts, the layering, Colin's beautiful vocal melodies, and just the overall serene and tender feeling that this song gives off, and a really nice follow-up to the opening track. Then we have another poppy Andy Partridge track titled Dear Madam Barnum. Amazing song, another one of the catchiest Andy Partridge vocal melodies in my opinion, and this is an XTC song I often find getting stuck in my head. After that we go into the first more experimental Andy Partridge track titled Humble Daisy, and I gotta say this is one of my favorite songs on this album. I think it's one of the most underrated XTC songs, and a perfect example of a song that really grew on me the more I listened to it, because there really is so much depth to this song. The chord progression is all over the place. His vocal parts are so awesome. And any section that features any sort of layered vocal parts in this one is so pretty and euphoric, particularly for the final closing section of this song. I could just listen to that section on loop over and over and over again. It just puts you in such a vibe. And then we have the second Colin Molding track titled The Smartest Monkeys. Very nice groovy track that brings the energy up nicely after Humble Daisy. This is another one that to me has almost a bit of a fusion sort of vibe at certain points between the drum grooves and the progressions in the guitars. 
Very cool song. Then we have a second hit from the album, an Andy Partridge track titled The Disappointed. Another song that once again showcases a great combination of Andy's amazing pop sensibilities, but also his Brian Wilson influences as well. And then we have a more psychedelic Andy Partridge track titled Holly Up on Poppy, definitely channeling some of those 60s psychedelic Dukes of Stratosphere vibes again, which is nice to hear. A very cool bass line on this one too. Colin really has some amazing and unique bass parts. The more I listen to his parts as I'm listening to XCC, just incredible bass player. After that, we have the one song on this album that I really can't stand. One of my least favorite XTC songs probably, but Crocodile. I've listened to this album so many times and given this song so many chances, but it has just never done anything for me. It has not grown on me. And uh, this is one big issue with this album for me is when it gets to this song, Crocodile, it's just always an instant skip over. I've just never been crazy about this song. But then we completely change gears and go into my favorite song on the album, Rook, and a song that might even make my top five Andy Partridge songs. This song is just so dark and eerie. The chord progression is all over the place. And to me, when it comes to the darker side of Andy Partridge, this song might be as good as it gets. I, I just love this song so much. And after that, we change gears again, but I love the flow going into this next song, Omnibus. I think this song has such a good energy to it and another one of the catchiest Andy Partridge vocal melodies. This is a song that I actually find myself going back to and listening to a lot. It might actually make my top 10 favorite XTC songs, believe it or not. Perfect contrast to Rook. Then we have another experimental Andy Partridge song called That Wave. So he's really hitting us with a handful of songs that are stretching out a bit more throughout the album, using some more experimental and dark chord progressions. And I love seeing that because, like I said, that's one of my favorite sides of Andy Partridge. And I think we are setting up a nice trajectory for the album that will follow this one, Apple Venus Volume 1. But once we finish this track, I will say that up to this point in the album, all of my favorite songs have already happened, with, with the exception of one. But I do think from this point on, the momentum does die down a little bit um, for the rest of the album, like I said, with the exception of one song that we're going to get to. But this would be one of my main reasons as to why I liked Oranges and Lemons better, and also why I was a little torn as to whether to give this one an A or an S. So I will say this is probably my least favorite album on the S tier, but I still think it's great. So next we have another romantic poppy Andy Partridge track titled Then She Appeared. This is a song that I actually didn't like when I initially heard the album, but the more I listened to it, it did grow on me a bit more. But it is a song that I have to be in a certain mood to listen to. I wouldn't say it's like a favorite of mine. Then we have Colin's third track titled War Dance. A very unique song. It's almost hard to categorize what this song is because there's so many different fusions of sounds going on. But it has a unique feel to it and a cool energy, but I wouldn't say it's like a standout track for me. But then after that, I would say that we have the standout track of the final chunk of the album, the beautiful Andy Partridge ballad titled Wrapped in Grey. Such beautiful piano work with these lush string parts over it and another very colorful and tasteful vocal melody from Andy. Just a track that gives me everything that I want from a beautiful Andy Partridge song. Now for the last three tracks, I do think the momentum dips down, but of the three, I would say that The Ugly Underneath is my favorite one. I do like the energy of this song, and I think it has some great vocal parts. But then Bungalow and Books Are Burning are two songs that I don't really care for. Um, Bungalow is okay, but it's one of those songs that I do have to be in a specific mood to listen to. I wouldn't say it has the same replay value of a lot of the other XTC songs. And Books Are Burning is a song I've never been able to get into, and I know a lot of people love that song, and they're probably going to be shocked to hear me say that, but I don't know, it just never did anything for me. So uh, I would say that's my main critique of this album for me, just from a song perspective, but of the songs that I do like on here, I think there are some really exceptional tracks and some that do make my favorite XTC song lists, in particular, all of the experimental Andy Partridge tracks on here. So to me, that's really the high point of this album. And I think those songs are good enough to really carry the weight to keep this album up in S tier. So I feel pretty comfortable putting it in there, but I was torn between A and S for a while. But ultimately, I do think this is an amazing album. So I'll give this one an S. Okay, next we have their 13th studio album from 1998 titled Apple Venus Volume 1. I'm going to give this one an A. 
I really like so much stuff about this album. There was a big chunk of time between this and the previous album with almost a seven year gap in between. And stylistically, I would say that this one does veer off a bit from where they had left off with Oranges and Lemons and Nonsuch, with this album taking on even more orchestral elements. And this would also be the last album featuring Dave Gregory on guitar. He left during the recording of this album due to a lot of tension between him and Andy and disagreements as to how much money they wanted to spend. Andy really wanted to use real instruments for all of the orchestral stuff and get as authentic of a sound as possible. And Dave wanted to use samples. So there was constant tension about the finances of the band throughout this album that ultimately pushed Dave out of it, unfortunately. But I think the majority of this album is very good and delivers some of my favorite XTC songs of the later part of their discography. I will say that it does have a couple of tracks here and there that are sort of skip over tracks for me. And I do think that stylistically, this one is a little bit more scattered and all over the place from track to track and not as cohesive as their previous two albums but in the grand scheme of things I do think it is an amazing album with some classic XTC tracks it opens up beautifully with River of Orchids a very pretty and lush atmosphere that is set by these string parts layered with trumpet and Andy has this very energetic melody that continues to layer and create more depth, a very tasteful opening song to the album. And then after that, we go into track two titled I'd Like That, which to me sounds like something right out of Rubber Soul, a perfect example of a track that really shows the Beatles' influence on Andy Partridge. Very pretty song. And then after that, we completely change gears and go into this very exotic and multi-dimensional Andy Partridge track called Easter Theater, which would probably make my top five favorite XTC songs incredible song with so much depth to it the amazing contrast from section to section combining that eerie opening part with that sort of happy celebratory second part has this really fascinating juxtaposition of parts that just seems to work so well together but seem completely unrelated on their own definitely one of my favorites of the experimental side of Andy Partridge then we go into probably my second favorite song on the album Nights and Shining Karma I don't hear people talk about this song too much but I think this is one of the most underrated Andy Partridge tracks of the later XTC years. It's got some of my favorite guitar parts of any of their songs. The chord changes are all over the place and has such an adventurous harmonic movement and all of Andy's melodies are just very tasteful and just fit so nicely over these really exotic chord changes. So I think at this point, when you look at the first four tracks and sort of look at the vibe from each of them, this album does feel a little bit more scattered. But as individual tracks, I like all of these a lot and I think they are very good. But I do think stylistically they are a bit all over the place. Then we have Colin's first track titled Frivolous Tonight, and there have been previous Andy Partridge tracks where I've said that I hear the Brian Wilson influence in him, and this is actually one where I kind of feel like I hear some Brian Wilson coming from Colin as well, which I had never heard that side of Colin, and I'm not even sure if Brian Wilson was an influence, but I've always kind of considered this to be Colin's like Brian Wilson type song, so if anybody has any more insight into that, I'd be very curious to hear about that. Then we change gears again and we go into an Andy Partridge track called Green Man. Very beautiful and earthy sounding track with some great instrumentation that is going on. I love the use of the saxophone and the flute as well as all of the different sorts of percussion. Some nice world music sort of elements going on in this one that make this song just feel really nice. After that, though, we have two tracks that I'm not very crazy about, and this would be the main part of the album where the momentum does die down a bit for me. Your Dictionary and Fruit Nut. The first one is an Andy song, and the second one is a Colin song, but both of these have just never done anything for me. Um, no matter how many times I listened to it, I kind of liked Your Dictionary at first, but for some reason, the more I listened to it, I liked it less and less. Not really sure why. But then the remaining three tracks of the album, I think, are very strong with I Can't Own Her, Harvest Festival, and The Last Balloon. The Last Balloon is probably one of my favorite ending tracks of any XTC album. I would put it up there with Complicated Game. And I do think it reaches levels of intensity similar to Complicated Game. It also has some of those very eerie chord progressions going on as well that add a whole nother layer of intricacy to it. And I've always felt like this is, once again, another one of those slept on tracks from this album between The Last Balloon and Nights in Shining Karma, I think both very underrated Andy Partridge songs um, that would both go down as some of my favorite XTC tracks. So like I said, I don't think the album is entirely coherent from front to back, and there are a couple of tracks that I'm not crazy about, but at the same time, I still think they're delivering some of their highest quality songs 
uh, to date. So I really, uh, you know, love this album, but I wouldn't say it's strong enough to give it an S due to the lack of cohesion and the couple of tracks that I don't like. But of the tracks I do like, I think it's incredibly solid. So this one gets an A. Okay, next we have their 14th and final studio album from 2000 titled Wasp Star, also known as Apple Venus Volume 2. And as much as I would love to say that they went out on a bang with this album, this is not one of my favorites of theirs, so unfortunately I'm going to give this one a B. I'm constantly torn about this album because I actually do listen to this album a good amount, and similar to Apple Venus Volume 1, there are a handful of individual tracks on here that I really love and will regard as some of my favorite tracks of the later XTC years. But I do think that it is less consistent from Apple Venus Volume 1 in terms of the quality of the tracks and just overall momentum of the album. But at the same time, there are a couple of incredible songs on here that I listen to all the time, particularly the first two songs. I think the first two tracks of this album might be two of the strongest opening tracks of the past couple XTC albums. I just love Playground and Stupidly Happy so much. Playground sets up a really nice feel-good vibe with the beautiful Andy Partridge pop sensibility. And then it goes into Stupidly Happy, which is a beautiful minimalist song where we just have this guitar riff going on over and over and over again, but then we keep adding layers on top of it and then eventually have this vocal canon and just so much beautiful richness to this song. And anytime I listen to this, it instantly puts me in a good mood. And a song that might even make my top 10 favorite XTC track list. Definitely my favorite on this album for sure. After that, we have a song by Colin titled In Another Life. And unfortunately, I'm not a fan of any of the three Colin Molding tracks on this album. I don't think that any of his contributions on here are particularly interesting. And while I'm not crazy about every Andy Partridge song on here, the Andy songs that I do like definitely carry this entire album for me. Uh, but I'm not even crazy about the next Andy track, My Brown Guitar. And then that's followed by Board It Up, another Colin track that I don't find particularly exciting. But then we have uh, two more really beautiful poppy Andy Partridge tracks, I'm the Man Who Murdered Love and We're All Light. Definitely two good tracks that were needed at this point to bring up the momentum a bit. But then we have the final Colin track titled Standing In For Joe, another one that I find kind of boring. And I'm not crazy about the following uh, Andy Partridge song either, Wounded Horse. So definitely more songs, as you can see, that I dislike on this album compared to Apple Venus Volume 1. But then we have a song that I absolutely love, You and the Clouds Will Still Be Beautiful. I love the vibe of this one. I think it creates so much beautiful imagery and has such a great energy to it. And then we have another Andy song that I really enjoy called Church of Women. Super adventurous song in terms of the chord progressions, weaving in and out of all sorts of different keys with these really interesting chord movements and key changes. Some beautiful vocal melodies from Andy. And then I really enjoy the closing track as well, The Wheel and the Maypole. I love the guitar parts on this one. The song has a real intensity to it and I think the guitar parts have a lot to do with that. A perfect hard-hitting bass badass Andy Partridge song to leave things off on for the final XTC album. So I do think that it does redeem itself with the last three tracks, and I do think the beginning couple are very strong, and there are a couple of good moments in the middle, but there are a lot of songs sandwiched in between that I'm not crazy about, and I do think just the momentum of this album is a little bit too scattered and has too many skip over tracks for me to put it in A tier. So I wouldn't say it's the best album to leave off on, but at the same time, they're still producing a handful of really great XTC songs that I can't complain about because, you know, they have great replay value and I still regard them as some of the best XTC songs of their later part of their career. So the final album gets a B. All right, we did it. We went through all 14 of their albums, the 12 XTC albums and the two Dukes of Stratosphere albums. I usually consider them to be part of the same thing, but if you like to split them up, you can you know make it like that as well. Uh, but like I said, I just really love the diversity of opinion in the XTC community. I love hearing everybody's varying takes on how they rank their albums and different reasons as to why certain XTC albums resonate with certain people. So I would love to hear your thoughts and how you rank their albums, where you agree and disagree disagree with me. So please let me know in the comments. And thank you so much for listening to this. I hope it was enjoyable. And I hope you learned a couple of new facts about XTC that you may not have known before. And if you are new to XTC and are unsure where to start, hopefully this video can give you a little bit more guidance as to what you might like from them. Because for the career that they had, 
their albums really did evolve very much throughout their career and I think there are multiple different layers to XTC and their sound and I think they have a little bit in their music that can satisfy everyone but they're still always completely authentic and always contain those unique flavors that are what make up a great XTC song. So thank you so much for watching this and if you are interested in checking out my other tier lists I've done a good amount of them so far they are linked in the comments and the descriptions as well so be sure to be on the lookout for that and stay tuned for more of them and yeah thanks so much again for watching and I will talk to you soon take care